to bring our next speaker out. Uh, every speaker, I'm asking them what their first car was and what the first piece of music that they bought with their own money was, as well as their bio. So our very next speaker is Mariam Namazi. Uh, Mariam, she's a political activist. She's the spokesperson for FITNA, which is the Movement for Women's Liberation and Other Civil Rights Groups. B uh, born in Iran, Mariam conducts activism for Iran, Canada, and Great Britain. Her first car is nothing because she's never driven, and her first music that she bought with her own money was a single by Donny Osmond. Perfect. Please welcome Mariam Namazi. Thank you very much. I'm so very happy to be here. I want to thank the wonderful organizers for this brilliant event and this weekend. And I also want to thank each and every one of you for coming out today. I think you should give yourselves a big round of applause for being here. It's well deserved. In the age of ISIS, in an age when we see the retreat of reason, being out loud and proud in defense of secularism and reason is important. If only to say, we exist. There are many of us. This, in and of itself, is important, whether in the US, whether in Iran, Saudi Arabia, or Afghanistan. It breaks the fear and the despair. It makes us feel and realize that we are not alone. It brings hope and with it courage. Being out loud and proud also means that we stand in solidarity with and honor our dissenters. People like Raif Badawi, sentenced to 10 years in prison and a thousand lashes in Saudi Arabia for merely raising the question of religion and politics. This month is his fourth year in prison. Walid Abul Khair, his lawyer and brother-in-law, who is also in jail. This month will be his birthday, another birthday spent in jail. Avijit Roy, the beloved Avijit Roy, and Bangladeshi atheist secularists and bloggers who are being hacked to death in broad daylight merely for defending reason. Avijit Roy's widow, Bonya Ahmad, is here today, and I want to send out my sincerest respects to her. The likes of Fatima Naout, an Egyptian poet sentenced to three years in prison merely for criticizing Islamic animal slaughter. Activists of Raqqa is being slaughtered silently, literally dying to expose ISIS. Jafar Azimzadeh and labor activists in Iran facing long-term prison sentences and 17 gold mining workers who were recently flogged 30 to 100 times just for labor rights organizing. Nargis Mohammadi sentenced to 16 years in prison for human rights work, 16 years. And on and on. Wherever the theocrats have power, it is the beginning of the end of reason, the beginning of the end of free thought, freedoms, and rights for everyone. Despite this, there are some on the left, and I say this as someone who is firmly on the left myself, who defend Islamism as a defense of people's culture and religion. Thanks, but no thanks. Islamism is not our culture. It is the culture of our fascists. If it were people's culture, the theocrats would not need to ban everything, including music, like in Mali. Just last Thursday, the Iranian regime flogged 35 boys and girls for 
participating in a mixed gender graduation party. They received 99 lashes each. If, ev if everyone agreed with them, they would not need to terrorize populations through indiscriminate violence. There would not be mass migration from countries that they rule. Let's not forget Let's not forget that Islamism has been built on a slaughtered generations of the Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia, often with US government complicity. Girls like 16-year-old Katya Bengana assassinated in the 90s in Algeria for refusing, for refusing to wear the veil. And political dissidents in Iran buried in mass graves in the Khavaran in the 80s in Iran after five minute trial. Their murders are commemorated every year by their families and the mothers of Khavaran despite arrest and abuse and threats by security guards. When people say that secularism is a Western neo-colonial demand, I don't know whether to laugh or to cry. Because no one understands the need, no one understands the need for the separation of religion from the state than those who live under the boot of the theocrats. And all theocrats, be it the Islamists, be it the Buddhist right, the Hindu right, the Jewish right, the Christian right. Of course, I know there are differences amongst and within this phenomenon. And of course, I know that the Islamists are the worst of them all because of the extent of the sheer power that they have. But fundamentally, the consequences of theocratic rule on people's lives is the same. The Buddhist right, massacring Muslims in Sri Lanka and Myanmar. The Hindu right, killing people for eating beef. The Jewish right, refusing to sit next to women on a plane. The Christian right, accusing children of witchcraft in Nigeria and bombing abortion clinics. And of course, the barbaric Islamists. Any degree of power for them means a corresponding degree of lack of rights and lives and freedoms for us. This is ignored by those on the left who side with the Islamists at the expense of our dissenters. I don't side with US militarism because I oppose the Iranian regime. They should learn to do the same. It's called multitasking. It's called fighting, fighting on several fronts at the same time. As Algerian sociologist Maria Mehele Lucas says, by supporting fundamentalists, this group simply chooses one camp in a political struggle without acknowledging it. The far right does the same. They conflate Muslims and migrants with Islamists and blame us all for the crimes of Islamism whether it's Pegida, whether it's Stop the War, sorry, Stop the War is the, uh, the left uh, um, apologist, Stop Islamization of America, the English Defense League, they shamefully place collective blame on dissenters, survivors, and victims. Look, I don't blame all Americans for the KKK, the bombing of Iraq, and Donald Trump. So please don't blame me for Islamic terrorism and Islamism. Stop defending, profiling of Muslims and calling for closed borders when victims who are fleeing Islamists need protection most. After all, this is not just a country of the KKK and Donald Trump. It is also the country of the 1912 Bread and Roses strikes of Joe Hill and of a vast, brilliant civil rights movement. This is why, this is why identity politics is so bogus. It erases social and political movements, class politics. The choices we make, where we stand, irrespective of our names, our places of birth, our immigration status. 
There is an atheist, for example, in every family that is presumed to be Muslim. There are ardent secularists amongst even the most ardent believers and in the smallest villages in the furthest corners of the globe. Dissent exists, often loud, proud, and out despite the risks. Like the unveiling movement in Iran, even though veiling is compulsory and punishable by imprisonment and fines. Or in Rojava, Syrian Kurdistan, where Sharia courts, forced marriages, and polygamy have been banned, and they are tearing down the rules that ISIS imposed on, the, on women's veiling. Identity politics or multiculturalism as a social policy makes it hard to see this immense dissent and our common humanity irrespective of our differences. It's the human being that has rights. It's the human being that should be sacred, not religions, cultures, and beliefs. When I tweeted that I was speaking here, I didn't do it on Facebook because they banned me yet again. Someone challenged me to prove why secularism is better when according to him, secularism brings AIDS and encourages the rape of women unlike Saudi Arabia, which is obviously a haven for women. My answer was simple. You have more rights in secular societies and no one gets legally thrown off of buildings for being gay. That's proof enough for me. Proof enough for me. In fact, secularism is a basic human right, as philosopher A.C. Grayling says. It's often conflated with atheism, but it's not just important for us atheists or religious minorities like Ahmadiyas and Baha'is, women, LGBTQ+, but everyone, including believers. After all, just because one is a believer doesn't mean one wants to live under the rule of the theocrats. The overflowing prisons, the overflowing gallows, the mass flight, unprecedented migration from countries where they rule is evidence of that. When government does God, it imposes religion on us all, says Richard Dawkins. And an imposition is no longer about the right to religion as a private matter, but about control and power. In the world that they want, everybody dies. In the world we want, everybody gets to live. Nonetheless, we are the aggressive secularists sometimes even, no joke, compared with the Taliban. Don't believe it, it's propaganda. In the world today, it is the secularists who are being slaughtered, not the other way around. They kill, they threaten our free thinkers, and we are accused of being offensive and censored in universities, in the media, by the likes of Ayatollah BBC, by Facebook, shame on you, Facebook. Shame on you for constantly censoring the pages of Arab atheists, Bangladeshi atheists, Iranian atheists, and ex-Muslims, and by governments. As if, as if cartoons and blasphemy are more offensive than murder. We are accused of denying people's right to religion when we are merely fighting for a corresponding right to be free from religion, and of course, to live to tell the tale. When you can be killed for your atheism and for criticism of Islam, criticism, by the way, that is much needed, normalizing and celebrating apostasy and blasphemy, out loud and proud are important forms of resistance. They kill, they maim, they kidnap our children, they bomb our schools and marketplaces, and we are accused of being unnecessarily provocative. No, we're just fighting back. We refuse to live on our knees. For many of us, the fight for secularism is a matter of life and death. It's not Western, 
It's not Eastern, it's universal. That is our message today from Washington, D.C. to Tehran, to Riyadh, to Dhaka, to Kabul, to Baghdad. We want secularism and we want it now. Thank you. Miriam Namazi. Wow.